Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Armor of God again. And as always, I'd like to start the video by thanking all of you for taking the time to be here with us, and hopefully you'll find what we have put together for you very edifying. Anyway, before I share anything further with you, there's something that I would like to address here beforehand. Some commented that I should cover about things like sleep paralysis, spiritual attacks, this attack by that or this demon. The thing is, from the start of this channel, I've covered a lot of subjects about the fallen angels, so if you have the time, you can check out the earlier videos. But from the start of this year, I've taken the approach of expanding the content of this channel to other areas of our faith, as you can see from the recent videos that we've released, where there's almost zero mention of demons. And while someone like Father Carlos Martins is indeed an exorcist, he is also a priest of the church, and as I've said before, there's so much more we can learn from him other than simply talking about exorcisms and demons, which is exactly what I intend to do again in this video. Anyway, I'm sorry for the long introduction to the video, but I'll kick this off now with the story shared by Father Martins. You know, I remember back in the 1980s, around 1987, there was baby Jessica, uh, a toddler in Midland, Texas, who had fallen down the shaft of a well. And when this was discovered, uh, it was it was worldwide news, and uh, the plan that was devised to attempt to get her out was to was to dig a, a, a tunnel that was parallel to the tunnel that she was in, and then dig across and uh, at the level where where they could estimate that she would be, and attempt to rescue her. And of course, it was nerve wracking because uh, at any point the, the the problem was Jessica's tunnel could collapse, uh, it could give way, and she could suffocate. Um, is she getting enough oxygen where she is? Can she breathe? And so forth. And thanks be to God, uh, through the, the work of, the tireless work of, of, of several folks, a, a group of folks, uh, Jessica was rescued. And she made it pretty well unscathed. Her, her toes, some of her toes were pinched and they had to be amputated. Uh, but she is a grown woman today and I believe she even has her own children. So we, we thank God for the continued blessing of, of her having been rescued. But I remember at the time, you know, the news was, was of course, this, this, this was the main news item uh, during the week that it was on, probably for two weeks. And, you know, of course, this is the problem with the news, that when the news becomes old, you have to create new news in order to keep people interested. And so I remember one of the gentlemen that participated in the rescue and had a great big role. Uh, you know, it was, it was exposed, it became a news item that he had some previous um, criminal charges against him, some drug charges, and maybe if I recall, and I, I, I'm not certain that I'm recalling correctly, maybe some um, theft charges, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not certain. Um, but nothing, uh, nothing like murder or, or, or rape or anything grievously evil of, of that sort. But the point is that if you were to ask Jessica's mother, who's now, who now has her baby, what she thought of this guy's criminal past, she, she would look at you like you were daft. She would look at you disgusted. And, and that she would look at you with the same look that God the Father is going to give when someone who, as if someone were present to present to him, look, you can't allow this person in heaven, even though this person contributed to the salvation of so many people, because look at the unsavory things that are in the past, right? Look at the unsavory things that, that, that this person did 30 years ago, 35 years ago, and so forth. You know, whatever is repented of, when, when one turns over a new life, the past is forgotten. And the past is no longer relevant. But imagine the joy of God the Father, how he will greet you when what you have to present to him is the fact that you help save his children, his other children. I mean, do you think he's going to care about your sins? Not in the least. Do, do you think baby Jessica's mother cared about what was unsavory in this rescuer of her daughter about his she 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 would care 
She wouldn't care. It wouldn't, it wouldn't enter into her consciousness right, because of the good that he did for her. And this is what we have to look forward to, folks, when we bless the Lord by rescuing his children. Right? This is the blessing we have to look forward to. When, when we live our lives in a way that points to eternal life, when we become witnesses for Christ right, in every area of our lives, when we witness to, 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 the, to the resurrection with joy, right? not just with a superiority in that this is the truth, but we let that truth reflect itself in joy and peace, tranquility, in being always ready to take the second place, in treating every man and woman out there like kings and queens, even our enemies. And friends, when people see that, there is the evidence of the resurrection, because people aren't like that. And the world doesn't produce that. Nothing else produces that. Only the certainty of the resurrected Christ can bring that kind of demeanor into our souls to treat every single man and woman out there like a king and a queen. And then friends, doing that, we have nothing to fear when we present ourselves before the Lord on Judgment Day. The next couple of clips that I'm going to share from Father Martin's here are both beautiful and powerful. And the first of the two is about blaming God for the unfortunate series of events that took place in our lives. I'm sure a lot of us can relate to this, and that's why I decided to share this clip of Father Martin's talking about it here for our reflection together. When misfortune or calamity comes upon us, many of us often blame God immediately. Uh, when, when we receive a medical diagnosis, for example, that, that is crushing, that, that is painful, and, 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 and certainly I'm not belittling that and, and the trauma that that is and, and, and the tragedy that it is. But many of us often right away blame God. Lord, why are you doing this to me? Right? I have done this for you and this for you and this for you and this for you and I try to live a good life and so on and so forth. You know, why are you doing this to me? As if, as if God was the cause of the cancer. As if, as if the, the, the destruction that we are facing is something that he has planned. And, and this is, this is crazy. This is a false, this, this is part of uh, our brokenness and a remnant of the fall of Adam and Eve within us. If you recall, the first, the, the first reaction that Adam and Eve had to one another is, is they felt a shame of their nakedness, so they, they clothed themselves. But part and parcel with that is they were afraid of God, so they hid themselves. Right? So, so the, the, the immediately upon the fall, a fear of God gripped us. And, and this fear is present within virtually all of us in some form or other until it is rooted out and redeemed. And, and so this, the, the manifestation of blaming God for something that befalls us, something that is unpleasant, is exactly that, a manifestation of the, of, of the fall within us. God does not will evil upon us. He does permit it. And, and if he permits it, it's because there's a divine purpose for it. We may not see the purpose. To demand to know the purpose of everything is equivalent to demanding to be God. Right? So it, it, it is <laughs> to, to, to pose a question to, to God and to demand an answer, uh, whether we say it in those words or not, or with our attitude, is, is, is a demanding that God obey us. That is simultaneously a claim to be God. That is the very temptation with which the serpent in the Garden of Eden tempted Adam and Eve. Right? What he said is, you will not die if you eat of this fruit. God doesn't want you to eat it because if you do, you're going to be like him. You, you are going to be gods. Right? So that, that is the primordial temptation, is the desire to be God within us. And the first manifestation of the fall is the fear of God. Right. An unhealthy fear of God, a, a terrify, a God, God terrifies us. So we, we, we have to hide from Him, right? He who created us, He who gave us uh, every, every, every blessing, and He who 
uh, created everything in order to fulfill the appetites that with which he has embedded us uh, this this is an uh, a, a direct result uh, the, the the fear of God the fear of the God, of, of the one who takes care of of us is is a manifestation of that fall uh, so uh, we would do well to eradicate that from us in this life because otherwise we will have to do so in the state of purgatory All right? because you can't go to heaven with a false notion of God with God being uh, in, in some sense a monster and that is what the the cruel and avenging God is the the God, if, if we believe that he's the one who sent the cancer, if we believe that he's the one who stands back and cruelly watch, watches us writhe in pain apart from any intervention on his part, that's not God. Right? And so if, if we're dying with that notion of God, then that God has to be slaughtered in the next life, so to speak, through suffering. And we need to then begin the, the journey into the therapy into gaining a true and proper uh, understanding of God within the next life within the city of purgatory and I tell you friends uh, from uh, the the words of the church from the words of the saints and mystics and from the testimonies of souls that God has permitted to communicate with the living that are in the state of purgatory it is much easier to eradicate that false notion of God in this life than it is through suffering in the next and the last clip of Father Martin's here will be one where he talks about forgiveness. Before I share the clip though, while editing this video I couldn't help but thinking about some people who were so angry with the video I've released about Pope Francis before. And some of those people have been here from the start of this channel last year. But these days if a Catholic is defending the Pope you're not attacked by non-Catholics or Protestants but by other Catholics who regard Pope Francis is not the Pope because the previous Pope, Pope Benedict resigned so Pope Francis is not really the Pope according to their logic. Then again, if I start to make videos to please people and making videos that promote disunity within the church then I really think at that point people should not tune into my videos anymore. Anyway, for the last clip of Father Martin's, there's a very beautiful message as well as reminder that he's sharing here. You must always be prepared to release someone from the debt that he or she owes you. And, you know, in, in doing this, in, 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 in our Lord's response, which he follows up with a, with a parable to illustrate the principle behind this is the fact that we owe ourselves a consistency with what we ourselves desire for ourselves. We, we owe others what we want to give ourselves. And so that the, the we have to be self-consistent. We, we cannot ask for ourselves what we are not permit, but what we, what we do not admit to someone else. And so when we forgive what we are doing, is participating in the divine nature. Here's why that is important. Our human nature, because of the fall of Adam, is broken. Right? It, is, it is broken. And so our Lord did not come to repair our human nature into what it was before. Our Lord came to raise it up into a sharing of his own divine nature. So we still retain our human nature, but it is repaired with the divine. And so what that means is that which on a human level doesn't make any sense, which seems foolish, which seems crazy, uh, you know, to keep forgiving someone who um, comes to us with a repentance. Now, our, you know, to be clear, someone who is not sorry, we cannot place ourselves in, in their pathway so that they can keep hurting us. Uh, that's not what our Lord is saying. But when there is a genuine, sor a genuine sorrow and contrition on the part of someone, then we, we have to forgive. Now, sometimes, you know, I'm thinking the example of the abused wife. You know, or her, her husband, uh, because of his own condition, mental condition and, and maybe substance abuse condition, uh, she she is required to forgive but she's not required to live in the same house as him in other words she cannot put herself in the path of 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 enabling the abuse 
and this goes for all of us. So we, we can't put ourselves in front of a freight train. Nevertheless, the, the forgiveness, even if it comes uh, at, at a distance, even if it is given uh, uh, at, a, at a great safe distance and, and, and such that the person is no longer even in our lives for our own safety and for their own good, uh, we're still required to do that. We're still required to forgive, to release from the debt. St. Maria Goretti, of course, is, is the great model of this. Uh, in her dying action, uh, she forgave her, her murderer, who was completely unrepentant at the time, uh, from her deathbed. And, and, and as she was dying, even after having made that forgiveness, uh, both the trauma of the action and the delirium that she was experiencing experiencing because of the peritonitis and the fever brought on by it she was terrified that he would come in the room and finish the job uh, so she kept asking he's not here is he he's not coming is he uh, so so there can be a forgiveness and still a the, the trauma is acute that we feel and and then the feelings of fear and and not wanting anything to do with the person right so forgiveness is something deeper than a mere relationship with that individual and that deeper thing is a, a, a congruence that we are making with the divine nature and an acceptance of the divine nature within us. And that, friends, is necessary for us, not, not, not just to receive uh, the divine forgiveness, but to make us eligible for the kingdom of heaven. Because no one who doesn't have God inside him or her can ever enter into God's kingdom. And now for the second half of this video this time, I would like to share a few things that we Catholics do. Hopefully our Protestant brothers and sisters watching this video will learn something about our Catholic faith. And the first one that I'd like to talk about is the sign of the cross. As you know, we Catholics make the sign of the cross, the Orthodox too as well, and to my knowledge, some Protestant denominations to them too, such as the Anglicans. While most of us learned it as children and when we pray, we always begin our prayer with that holy gesture. We do it so often, in fact, that we sometimes forget what it is we are doing. So what exactly are we doing? Well, despite its simplicity, the sign of the cross is an ancient prayer rich in meaning. Because each time we make the sign of the cross, we renew our profession of faith, express our belief in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and acknowledge the divine work of creation, salvation, and sanctification. We invoke the Holy Trinity. As we are reminded here, never leave your house without making the sign of the cross. It will be to you a staff, a weapon, an impregnable fortress. Neither man nor demon will dare to attack you, seeing you covered with such powerful armor. Let this sign teach you that you are a soldier ready to combat against the demons and ready to fight for the crown of justice. Are you ignorant of what the cross has done? It has vanquished death, destroyed sin, empty hell, dethroned the evil one, and restored the universe. Would you then doubt its power? And so... While we might consider it a small gesture, it is actually a big deal. And the Church recommends the practice of sanctifying our daily life with sacramentals, chief of which is the sign of the cross. When we make the sign of the cross before we begin an activity, we elevate whatever it is we are doing. It becomes an opportunity for drawing nearer to God. Other sacramentals are materials such as the holy water, liturgical or blessed candles, holy relics or items such as crucifixes, medals, or rosaries. And the sign of the cross is a sacramental gesture. And again, we are reminded, when you sign yourself, think of all the mysteries contained in the cross. It is not enough to form it with the finger. You must first make it with faith and goodwill. When you mark your breast, your eyes, and all your members with the sign of the cross, offer yourself as a victim pleasing to God. And the ritual of making the sign of the cross, if we aren't careful, can become quick and sloppy. Every time we make the sign of the cross, in private or in public, we need to be attentive to what it is we are doing. Whether we are at Mass or in a restaurant, it should be large and deliberate. Large because it is a witness to our faith and deliberate because it keeps our mind engaged on what we are doing. And it is also clear from circumstances and from early church fathers that the holy gesture of making the sign of the cross had its roots as a prayer in apostolic times. At every forward step and movement, at every going in and out, clothes and shoes, when we bathe, when we sit at table, when we light the lamps on seat, in all the ordinary actions of daily life, we trace upon the forehead the sign. Initially, the sign of the cross was made with the thumb, usually on the forehead but sometimes on the lips and chest. 
This small sign of the cross was commonly used by the end of the 4th century and is still used today at every Mass and in the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and the anointing of the stick. It is also used for marking the forehead with ashes on Ash Wednesday. By the 6th century, people were using the first two fingers held together to make a large sign of the cross touching the forehead, chest, and shoulders. The two fingers symbolize the two natures which are divine and human of Jesus Christ. The use of three fingers became popular in the ninth century, by which the thumb and first two fingers were held outstretched together to symbolize the Trinity, while the remaining two fingers were bent to signify the two natures of Christ. This form of the large cross is still used today in Eastern churches where the right shoulder is touched before the left. And finally, it is appropriate to make the sign of the cross whenever we are feeling spiritually attacked. The devil hates this sign, so we wield a spiritual power when we use it. Many of us can recall old movies in which people would cross themselves when in the presence of death upon receiving bad news or when afraid. Sadly, this custom has fallen out of use, but it is a sure way to drive away fear and inspire courage. So let us bring it back into practice. Let us never forget the powerful prayer that is the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And just one more that I would like to also share in this video. Why do priests use incense at Mass, and where does it come from? Well, for this question, I'm going to share an answer provided by Father William Saunders. The use of incense in the ancient world was common, especially in religious rites where it was used to keep demons away, popular among the Assyrians, Babylonians, and Egyptians. In Judaism, incense was included in the thanksgiving offerings of oil, rain, fruits, wine. And the Lord instructed Moses to build a golden burning of incense, which was placed in front of the veil to the entrance of the meeting tent, where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. We do not know exactly when the use of incense was introduced into our Mass or other liturgical rites. At the time of the early church, the Jews continued to use incense in their own temple rituals, so it would be safe to conclude that the Christians would have adapted its usage for their own rituals. In the liturgies of St. James and St. Mark, which in their present form originate in the 5th century, the use of incense is mentioned. A Roman ritual of the 7th century marks a usage in the procession of a bishop to the altar and on Good Friday. Moreover, in the Mass, an incensation at the Gospel appears very early, at the Offertory in the 11th century, and at the Introit in the 12th century. Gradually, its usage was extended to the incensing of the celebrant and assisting clergy. The purpose of incensing and the symbolic value of the smoke is that of purification and sanctification. For example, in the Eastern Rites at the beginning of Mass, the altar and sanctuary area were incensed, while Psalm 50 was chanted invoking the mercy of God. The smoke symbolizes the prayers of the faithful drifting up to heaven. The psalmist prays, Let my prayer come like incense before you, the lifting up of my hands, like the evening sacrifice. The book of Revelation describes the heavenly worship as follows. Another angel came in holding a censer of gold. He took his place at the altar of incense and was given large amounts of incense to deposit on the altar of gold in front of the throne, together with the prayers of all God's holy ones. From the angel's hand, the smoke of the incense went up before God, and with it, the prayers of God's people. And then incense may be used during the entrance procession, at the beginning of Mass, to incense the altar, at the procession and proclamation of the gospel, at the offertory, to incense the offerings, priest, and people and at the elevation of the sacred host and chalice of precious blood after the consecration. During funeral masses, the priest at the final commendation may incense the coffin, both as a sign of honor to the body of the deceased, which became the temple of the Holy Spirit at baptism, and as a sign of the faithful's prayers for the deceased rising to God. The usage of incense adds a sense of solemnity and mystery to the Mass. The visual imagery of the smoke and the smell remind us of the transcendence of the Mass which links heaven with earth and allow us to enter into the presence of God. Well, I think that is all for the video this time. As always, I hope you've learned a lot from this video and I truly enjoy making them for you because I'm learning while doing it. And remember, if there's any feedback or suggestion, please let me know in the comments below. Anyway, if you'd like to support our works, I left a link to our PayPal donation in the description box below. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much everybody for your continuous support, contribution, and prayer. And until the next one, stay safe, stay healthy, and may God bless you.